This is the first lecture for learning unit four about different materials that circulate through our body. Um, this lecture will be covering specifically blood cells and some other proteins that circulate through blood. Uh, that will transition into lymph cells um, as we focus on specifically white blood cells. So that lecture will be posted on Sunday. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of how these tie together, uh, it should say learning unit four. Sorry for not catching that, um, but I guess it did continue from lear uh, learning unit three. Um, kind of an idea of how everything fits together in lecture and lab. I, I color coded some of the topics. Um, so last week in lecture, we covered the cardiovascular system, talking about the heart, blood vessels, and circulation. That corresponds with your lab this week, so kind of getting you prepared for that so you had some time to integrate that knowledge. We also covered the respiratory system, which I like to cover at the same time as the cardiovascular system because they work so closely together. Um, you'll cover the, uh, the respiratory system in lab during um, the week of October 11th, so kind of doing a lab on respiratory volume. Um, and right now in lecture, we're covering blood and lymph, and so you'll be going over that in lab next week. So even though things are slightly out of order, um, these few weeks fit together really nicely between lecture and lab, um, so hopefully this color-coded map helps you see that. So as we're going through learning unit four and discussing blood and lymph, um, I italicized the learning objectives that are going to be in the next lecture, um, but I want you to start thinking about how erythrocytes, leukocytes, and thrombocytes are formed um, and roughly how long they live. Uh, you should be thinking about the function of different cells, so different red or red blood cells in general, different white blood cells and platelets, um, thinking about the mechanism by which white blood cells actually leave the bloodstream, because that's going to be very important in talking about um, the lymphatic system and the immune system um, and how they travel to different types of tissue. Uh, you should understand what a differential white blood cell count is and think about what elevated cell levels might mean for an individual's health. Um, you should be very familiar with the process of hemostasis, which is a fancy way of saying clotting. Um, that will be important for you to be able to write out on the next lecture exam. Um, you should also be thinking about blood typing and more generally the importance of surface proteins and surface antigens. So we're again going to focus primarily on blood today, um, thinking about those formed elements within blood. Uh, since the, a lot of the learning objectives cross multiple sections, I just had that slide. I'm not going to have a separate what you should focus on here, but you should definitely look at the bullet points above this lecture um, and make sure that you pay attention to those. So again, when we're thinking about the cardiovascular system, we have that pump that's the heart and it's hooked up to vessels in which our blood is contained. But that blood is very dynamic and there's a lot of stuff happening inside of it um, and it's an important transport system for so much of our body. So remember, when we're talking about connective tissue, connective tissue has cells that are dispersed through a ground substance, which might be fluid, um, and in the case of blood, it's the, um, the formed elements and the plasma. So blood is a connective tissue. And um, remember that each of those distinct set of cells in blood have different functions. So when we're thinking about red blood cells and white blood cells and platelets, they all have very distinct functions, even though they're all in blood. Oftentimes when we think about blood, we think about red blood cells, but there's so much more going on there. So when we're thinking about blood as a connective tissue, again, the cellular part of it are the formed elements, and that matrix, that grounding substance, is called plasma. Plasma is about 55% of blood, formed elements are about 45%, and that plasma has quite a bit of stuff dissolved in it. We'll briefly talk about some of those proteins that are mentioned there. Um, and as we talk about other systems, like for example, um, the endocrine system and uh, uh, and the, um, sorry, my daughter's crying, so I'm a bit distracted, um, and also the excretory and kidney system. We'll be thinking about a lot of those solutes, um, but right now we're focusing primarily on erythrocytes, leukocytes, and thrombocytes. <laughs> 
So when we're looking at those formed elements, one measurement that we can take um, is the packed cell volume. Um, so that's looking at what percent of the formed elements are specifically erythrocytes, so those red blood cells. Um, that usually ranges from 37% to 52%, and that's measured by a test called a hematocrit. Um, that hematocrit test definition is an important thing for you to know. So overall, when we're thinking about the functions of blood, um, remember that you know usually what we think of when we think of blood is delivering oxygen to body tissue and also removing carbon dioxide, so respiratory gases. But blood has way more functions than that. It also delivers nutrients, so it's very important for absorbing material from the digestive system, going through the hepatic portal system and transporting it through our body. Um, as this GIF is showing, it's important for defense. So we have white blood cells, um, we have phagocytosis happening, um, platelets and different proteins. Again, we'll talk about clotting and its role in defense today um, and kind of talk more about primary lines of defense on Sunday. Um, and also maintaining homeostasis. So the flow of blood is really important for regulating our temperature, um, the bicarbonate buffer system and other components like that are important for regulation of pH. And blood is also very important for regulating water content and more generally osmoregulation. So I mentioned there are a few plasma proteins that are especially important. The globulins will be very important when we talk about the immune system in the next lecture. And fibrinogen is important for when we talk about clotting today. So just a quick review of these. Albumin, um, albumin is a binding protein. It's very important for transporting fatty acids and also steroid hormones. Um, so remember when we talked about digestive physiology, we saw that stuff that is hydrophobic um, is kind of hard to transport in interstitial fluid and in blood. So it has to be bound to different material. So albumin is an important binding protein to move fatty acid around as well as steroid hormones um, and also maintain water in the blood. Globulins, by globulins we usually mean antibodies. Um, so this is a diverse group uh, that includes transport proteins um, that are important for moving vitamins as well as antibodies. So when we say immunoglobulins, we're specifically referring to antibodies. And then fibrinogen is uh, involved in the clotting mechanism, hemostasis, that we'll talk about uh, in a little bit. So when we're thinking about how blood cells are formed, uh, in general, this process is called hematopoiesis. It's also called hemopoiesis, so it's made the same thing. Um, and so the areas in which that take place uh, change over time. So here we have a chart where it shows um, the proportion of cells that are coming from different uh, sites in the body. Um, and so we have different fetal months, so throughout gestation and then years after birth. Um, so you see that in, um, in uh, utero, you have a lot of hematopoiesis happening in the yolk sac, the liver, the spleen, and then towards the end of fetal development, when you start actually getting more bone marrow, it starts happening more in the bone marrow. And when um, humans are very young, a lot of that takes place in the long bones. So you see the tibia and the femur peak uh, before age 10 and then kind of drop off. Um, and then into adulthood, hematopoiesis happens a lot more in the vertebrae, sternum, and ribs. Um, and so uh, another thing to note is that, so remember the um, kind of long portion of a long bone is called the uh, medullary cavity. So when we say extra medullary hematopoiesis, we mean hematopoiesis that's happening not in that medullary cavity, not inside of the bone. Um, so hematopoiesis in the liver and spleen. And even though that drops off after birth, um, it can actually continue if you have situations um, in which the bone marrow is compromised, like with different types of cancer, um, the liver and spleen can compensate by going through hematopoiesis. And we also have development of some blood cells in the lymph nodes. So when we're thinking um, about the formation of cells, we should be thinking about stem cells. And remember when, um, when you first have life forming, that's when you have those totipotent stem cells very early on in development. They can differentiate into any type of cells. 
um, if you have like some limitations, those are pluripotent, they're still pleural potential. And then if you have a stem cell that can only divide into cells within a certain type of lineage, so for example, blood cells, those are multipotent stem cells. So when we talk about different types of blood cells and their um, development and differentiation, they're coming from a type of multipotent stem cell. Uh, called a hematopoietic stem cell or a hemocytoblast. So that's what's uh, starred right there. Um, and so when you have these blood cells forming and differentiating, that hemato hemocytoblast goes through mitosis, makes a copy of itself. So one of those cells, is, one of those daughter cells is going to replace that um, multipotent hematopoietic stem cell. It's gonna make sure that you have the same number of stem cells. And then that new cell is going to differentiate. So it's going to um, become pluripotent stem cells and eventually, or an oligo, sorry, not pluripotent, it's gonna go to oligopotent and then to unipotent stem cells. So those myeloid stem cells and lymphoid stem cells are oligopotent stem cells. Um, they're gonna differentiate further. For unipotent stem cells, uh, that's something like the lymphocytes, which can replace themselves depending on the type. So here, um, I would never ask you a detailed question about this schematic. We're going to focus on uh, the different blood cell types individually. So we're going to think about how platelets are formed. We're going to think about how erythrocytes are formed. We're going to think about how white blood cells are formed. Um, but those are kind of going to be distinct. So uh, we'll take them through one at a time. Um, so you would never have to like fill out a chart like this, but you do have to kind of know groupings for white blood cells. You do need to know about um, how we give rise to red blood cells and platelets, so keep that in mind. Um, so when we're thinking about how this process is controlled, there's a few key hematopoietic growth factors that we have to keep in mind. Um, one that's very important for you to know is EPO, which stands for erythropoietin. This increases the production of red blood cells. So red blood cells are erythrocytes. Erythropoietin increases the production of red blood cells. And this is secreted by the kidneys in response to low oxygen. And we'll talk about that mechanism in just a moment. Thrombopoietin makes platelets, which are also called thrombocytes. So thrombopoietin makes thrombocytes. Um, and just like erythropoietin, it's a glycoprotein. Uh, it's produced in the livers as well as the kidneys the liver, you only have one liver, sorry about that. Um, and then cytokines are a more general um, kind of used uh, signaling factor. Um, they're involved in a lot of different types of signaling and immune response and secreted by red bone marrow, leukocytes, fibroblasts, and endothelial cells. So they're a little bit more general. So when we're thinking um, kind of about bone marrow, you might be familiar with bone marrow transplants, and I wanted to take a moment to touch on those because uh, the effective effectiveness of them comes down to this idea of surface antigens, which we'll talk about in the context of red blood cells. Um, so when you don't you join a donor registry to kind of get on the list and make yourself available to provide a bone marrow transplant um, or a bone marrow donation, basically they send you a swab, you swab your mouth and then uh, send it back and then they kind of screen your, um, your blood cell types um, and determine who you would match with. So uh, you could go to bethematch.org and sign up very easily. Um, and it used to be really painful to donate bone marrow if you were chosen as a match um, because they would have to stick a very large bore needle uh, near your iliac crest on your hip bones. Um, so that used to be very painful, but now all they do is take a blood sample, um, isolate your um, hematopoietic stem cells, um, and culture them uh, with those different growth factors. So they do cell culture in the lab, um, and then the patient who's receiving them has their um, bone marrow basically kind of, or their uh, stem cells destroyed, and then they receive the healthy stem cells. And this is very important for people to do, um, especially if you're from uh, mixed race backgrounds um, or, you know, uh, South Asian descent or Latinx descent or black um, because your immune system has to match the person you're donating to in order to prevent tissue rejection. And there's a lot of cases of 
quite young, healthy people who get leukemia, who need a bone marrow match, um, but are of South Asian descent or other descent um, and can't find a match even among their family. Um, so that has to do kind of with those surface proteins. Um, specifically nature histocompatibility antigens, or MHC1 and 2. Uh, we'll talk about this more when we talk about the immune system and the lymphatic system. Um, so looking at those antigens and making sure they match between different individuals is important uh, to prevent um, rejection. Um, and uh, this is done through histocompatibility testing, so tissue matching. And here's some statistics about how likely it is for you to find a bone marrow match. Um, so if you're white, then you have a 97% chance of finding a match. Um, Latinx, 80% chance. Uh, indigenous, 77%. Um, and then if you're Asian or African, or uh, African descent, um, then there's a lot lower chance of finding a match. So kind of continuing along those trends of the proteins that are on the surface of blood cells, when we talk about the blood type, um, we're thinking about antigens that are on our red blood cells. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this from earlier classes, but I just wanted to review. Um, so when we're thinking about type A blood, um, that has just the A antigen. Type B blood has just the B antigen. Type AB has both A and B antigens, and type O has no antigens on the surface. Um, and so then you also have different antibodies in the plasma of your blood to account for these differences in antigens. Um, so that's why when you receive a blood transfusion, you have to get it from a matching donor. Um, so if you are type A, you can only receive blood from type A and type O because type O doesn't have any um, mismatched antigens or any uh, da dangerous antibodies um, in that blood. Type B can only receive from type B or O, um, and then type AB is the universal receiver. They can receive any type of blood because they match everyone else. Um, and then type O is the universal donor because you can donate that blood to any other individual. So that's why uh, if you have type O blood, a lot of um, blood banks will be eager to receive your blood because it's particularly useful in clinical settings. Blood typing is not just done with the AB uh, antigens, it's also done with rhesus factor, which um, is another antigen. Um, basically, you have it or you don't. So when we're referring to blood type, it's also positive or negative. That positive is referring to having rhesus factor. That negative is referring to not having rhesus factor. Um, and rhesus factor kind of makes things complicated uh, during pregnancy, depending on mismatches between maternal blood and fetal blood. So in thinking about the shape and structure of erythrocytes and red blood cells, that it, uh, becomes really important for their function. Um, so red blood cells have to be filled with hemoglobin. We talked about kind of how much they have. They have to have room for all of that hemoglobin. And so they don't have a lot of organelles. Um, they don't have mitochondria, so they use anaerobic respiration. That means that they're also not using the oxygen that they're carrying, which is very important. Um, they don't have endoplasmic reticulum, so that means they don't synthesize proteins, and they also don't have a nucleus. So they're not replicating their DNA and dividing. Remember that they're being replaced by hematopoietic stem cells. They're also biconcave in structure, so they're kind of like flattened, like a cookie on either side. Um, and so uh, they have this unique shape that's really adapted for moving through different vessels and maximizing surface for gas exchange. Um, so their surface structure facilitates gas exchange. Um, and they also are able to really easily change their structure. Um, you can see when there's the branching of this vessel, the bottom branch, you see that blood cell going through and kind of being squeezed. Um, they have a unique cytoskeleton that allows them to move through tight vessels quite easily. Their structure changes as they go through different vessels with different restrictions. So when we're thinking about their life cycle, um, remember that they start out with that hematopoietic stem cell, the hemocytoblast, um, and then they divide uh, and differentiate into these proerythroblasts. So blast is a type of cell, erythro is referring to red blood cell, and pro is kind of like 
early or proto before. So it's before they become a red blood cell, but they're definitely on that pathway. So hemocytoblast, proerythroblast, and they get into the de facto developmental pathway. Um, so early erythroblasts, late erythroblasts, normal blasts, and then after they eject their nucleus, they're called a reticulocyte. So that transition is very important um, because remember, red blood cells, erythrocytes don't have a nucleus. This is where you're getting very close to the formation of more erythrocytes. So measuring how many reticulocytes we have is a pretty important metric. Um, so this process is occurring in red bone marrow. Um, red blood cells live about 120 days and they're constantly being made. So more than 2 million cells are produced per second. Um, and on average, we have about 0.5 to 1.5% of all red blood cells being reticulocytes. So that's a good baseline to have to make sure that your red blood cells are being replaced in a healthy way. When we're thinking about hemoglobin, remember that uh, there's four chains of this globin protein. Um, each of those has heme in it, so it's that red pigment with an iron ion in the center of it. Um, four oxygen molecules can be carried per hemoglobin. I'm reviewing this because we've already talked about this quite extensively. Um, but, and then each red blood cell can carry about 300 million hemoglobin and 1.2 billion oxygen molecules. So quite a lot of hemoglobin, quite a lot of oxygen, and 2 million red blood cells being produced per second. So uh, you build up a lot of hemoglobin. And as those red blood cells age every 120 days, it has to be broken down as well. So there's an important kind of uh, waste removal process for that. Um, so the globins are broken down and the amino acids are used for protein synthesis. So those get reused. Iron is also reclaimed and then uh, the remaining components of heme become bile. So this is an image showing the complete life cycle of a red blood cell, kind of going through that um, stem cell process, the function of them, and the breakdown. Um, and uh, other things to kind of keep in mind are that you need a lot of iron, copper, zinc, and B vitamins to form those erythrocytes. Um, and here you can see the different breakdown pathways that the globin portion, the heme pigment, and the iron follow after the... Uh, Red blood cells have been broken down by a macrophage. So again, remember that uh, when hemoglobin is oxygenated, we call it oxyhemoglobin. It looks a certain way when it's deoxygenated. Uh, the color changes a little bit, so, but it does not become blue. Um, and when it's not carrying oxygen, we call it deoxyhemoglobin. When it's actively carrying carbon dioxide, we call it carbaminohemoglobin. Um, remember that when we kind of look at whether hemoglobin is carrying oxygen or not, we can kind of get quantitative about that and use it as an important metric. Um, and so when the hemoglobin in our tissues, uh, or when our tissues in general are deprived of oxygen, we call that hypoxia. When we're looking at our blood specifically, and that has low oxygen, um, then we call that hypoxemia. So when we measure that, we can do it two different ways. We can look at oxygen saturation in the hemoglobin, and if it's less than 95%, we say that the individual has hypoxemia. If the uh, partial arterial pressure of oxygen is um, 80 to 100 uh, millimeters of mercury, then we say that they have hypoxemia. So in hypoxia, we're measuring oxygen in tissues, it's hard to do that in a lab setting, so uh, it's kind of inferred that when you have hypoxemia, you probably have hypoxia. It's quite easy to take a blood sample or to put one of those little finger probes on and determine oxygen saturation levels. So when a patient does have hypoxemia, um, blood is filtered through their kidneys, um, and there's actually sensors on the kidneys uh, in the tissue um, that determines the oxygen levels. And so if oxygen saturation levels are low, the kidney is going to sense that and start secreting erythropoietin. So remember, erythropoietin was a very important growth factor uh, in the production of blood cells, specifically red blood cells. So that erythropoietin that's uh, secreted by the kidneys and also by the liver 
sorry, sensed by the liver, but not secreted by the liver. Um, that's the thrombopoietin. Uh, but when the kidney and liver sense that there's low oxygen, um, the erythropoietin secreted from the kidneys, the thrombopoietin secreted by the liver and the kidneys, you have more um, red blood cells being produced and stimulated in those that red bone marrow. Uh, you have an increased red blood cell count. And even though you might have low uh, hemoglobin saturation levels still, you have more red blood cells to increase your oxygen transport and compensate for that difference. So remember when we talked about altitude sickness in the respiratory physiology lecture, um, and we talked about all the problems associated with having low hemoglobin oxygen saturation saturation levels, this is one of those compensatory mechanisms. Our kidneys sense the low oxygen, secrete erythropoietin, stimulates the bone marrow, we have more red blood cells being produced, and we have increased oxygen transport. And this is a negative feedback loop, so as you have adequate levels of oxygen saturation, your EPO secretion drops because um, your kidneys are sensing that change, and then you're not producing too many red blood cells. So you're keeping yourself in homeostasis. So there can be different problems with the structure of red blood cells, which leads to problems with their function. Um, I'm sure you've learned about sickle cell anemia and how having those sickle cell shaped red blood cells can be quite dangerous because it stops microcirculation in the capillaries, uh, it leads to a lot of issues. Um, polycythemia is another issue where maybe due to dehydration or high altitudes where you have increased red blood cell production or bone marrow disease, um, you might have a higher proportion of red blood cells relative to uh, the plasma. And in that case, you know, you might have great oxygen saturation, but your blood is very viscous and it's not able to move through your vessels quite as well. Okay, so thinking about leukocytes, which are white blood cells, um, these are far fewer in number than erythrocytes. We'll look at some micrographs of blood smears so you can visualize that and look at kind of some of the statistics. Um, they're much larger on average than red blood cells and they're actually complete cells. So they do have all their organelles. Remember, red blood cells are missing nuclei, mitochondria, and a plasmic reticulum. White blood cells have all those organelles, and they can actually leave the bloodstream and interact with body tissue. Again, that's going to be very important for the immune system. So when we look at the proportions here, um, remember they are less numerous than the erythrocytes. So on average, you have about 5,000 to 10,000 um, white blood cells uh, per mil in men, and then 5,000 to 10,000 also in women. Um, whereas erythrocytes, red blood cells, range from 4 to 5.5 times 10 to the 6 per mil. So orders of magnitude more red blood cells than white blood cells. So when we're thinking about the leukocyte life cycle, remember there's a lot of different cells that fall into that white blood cell category, but on that you know, diagram, that dendrogram, you saw that they come from a lot of different branches. So all of these leukocytes are gonna begin their life in bone marrow and then secondary production and maturation of B and T cells, those lymphocytes, um, is going to occur in lymphatic tissue in germinal centers. And leukocytes also have a much more varied lifespan. So whereas red blood cells are consistently living about 120 days before they wear out um, and get cleared out of our body, leukocytes can live anywhere from hours to years. So on average, most of them live hours to days, some live months to years, and then those BNT cells, those lymphocytes, are also capable of mitosis, so they can make copies of themselves and pass on um, some information that they've gained, and we'll talk about that again more in the immune system. So when we're thinking about different leukocytes, uh, these are very important for both innate and adaptive immunity, um, and so when we look at these, uh, we can kind of divide them broadly into granulocytes and agranulocytes. Both are names uh, of the groups, granulocytes and agranulocytes, and individual names like neutrophil, eosinophil, and basophil are all uh, kind of determined based on their staining characteristics, which I'll verbally tell you as we go through them, but you won't be tested on. So you should focus more on their function than how they visually look. 
Um, and in lymphocytes, we have uh, those B and T lymphocytes and natural killer cells. Today, we're going to kind of group them all together. And again, on uh, the next lecture, we'll kind of divide them up um, into individual functions. So in terms of the granular leukocytes, those are neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. Um, neutrophils are the most predominant. They account for 50 to 70 percent of white blood cells. Um, and here you can see there's two of them. They're the purpley cells surrounded by red blood cells, um, and they are much larger than red blood cells, and they have all these granules and lobes in them. Um, so that big purple thing is their lobed nucleus. Um, they're very effective at phagocytosis, and they also can produce a couple of different things to deal with bacteria and fungi. They produce a lysozyme, uh, which is an enzyme that breaks down bacterial cell walls. And they also produce these defensins that are able to break apart pathogen membranes, so bacteria and fungal membranes, and then all the cell contents kind of leak out. Um, and so you are tend to have higher neutrophil levels in periods of stress, um, whenever you have serious burn injuries because you're more likely to get infected, and then also during pregnancy, your neutrophil levels rise. Um, and so here they're called neutrophils because they stain very effectively with neutral dyes. Eosinophils account for 2 to 4 percent of your white blood cells. Um, here you can see that they have a lot of those kind of pinkish granules, but they have two, uh, just a couple lobes, or so fewer lobes uh, in their nucleus, so it's not as branched or you know, lobed apart as the neutrophil. Um, and they work a little bit differently. So they produce antihistamines, uh, so they can kind of manage the histamine production that comes when you have foreign intruders um, or immune sensitivity. And then they can also break down larger parasites. So whenever you have parasitic worms, your eosinophil levels are raised. Um, so they are effective at kind of secreting different compounds that are used to help break down bigger structures. Um, and they also can be phagocytotic. So then basophils are only about 1% of white blood cells. Um, these are slightly smaller than the other two. Uh, they have larger granules. So you can see in the graphic at the top, their granules, which are the small dots that are covering the whole cell, are larger than the eosinophils and the neutrophils. And their nucleus uh, only has two lobes. So it's not as kind of bumpy as the neutrophil and eosinophil. Um, these are responsible for intensifying inflammatory response. They release a histamine, so the eosinophils were important with antihistamine, basophils release a histamine, um, and they're similar in function to mast cells. Um, they also release a uh, molecule called heparin, which uh, stops blood clotting. So when we talk about hemostasis and kind of regulations on hemostasis, keep heparin in mind. Okay, so getting into those agranular leukocytes, there's lymphocytes. These are about 20 to 30% of white blood cells. And again, those include B cells, T cells, and NK cells, which are natural killer cells. We'll talk about them a lot more in the next lecture. And then the other type of um, kind of agranular leukocyte is the monocyte. Um, this is about two to 8% of the white blood cells. Um, so then macrophages specifically are monocytes that have differentiated. So when we're talking about macrophages, we're talking about monocytes. Um, so there's a lot of phagocytotic cells that are not technically macrophages. That can get confusing. Um, but these are very effective at phagocytosis. They can break are kind of consume and break down debris, pathogens, um, old red blood cells, and other cells that are at the end of their life cycle. So when we're thinking about these, remember I was kind of going through and giving you those uh, normal values or ranges. Um, and so when you do a differential white blood cell count, that's when you take a blood sample and look at those proportions of white blood cells. Um, so this is very important for comparing actual values to a baseline and using it to diagnose different conditions. So for example, if your neutrophil levels are elevated, you might have, be under stress, you might have different bacterial infections, um, but then again, you might also be pregnant. So you have to consider the patient's physiology when you're comparing these values. You can't just take the you know, set standard. You have to think about what they're going through, their disease state um, or their physiological state. 
Um, for lymphocytes, those, again, are about 25 to 33%, and so elevated levels might be if they have mono, whooping cough, viral infections, monocytes, uh, elevated levels might indicate different infections, so different protozoan infections, bacteria or fungal. Um, eosinophil, like I mentioned, uh, elevated levels are associated with parasitic worms, but also allergic reactions and autoimmune diseases. Remember that eosinophils release antihistamines, so if you have a powerful hypersensitivity immune response, maybe allergies or an autoimmune condition, it's beneficial to have more of these cells that are producing an antihistamine. And then with basophils, if you have elevated levels, that's associated with different cancers, chicken pox, hypothyroidism, a lot of different conditions. So you should know the function of a white blood cell count. Um, we might, uh, in a future activity on Canvas, look at kind of different um, examples of differential white blood cell counts and read more about them. So when we're thinking about the function of white blood cells, remember that they are leaving the bloodstream. So that's an important function that they do. And we call this emigration or diapedesis. Um, so this is very important for their role in defense because they are able to actually leave the circulatory system, go where they're needed. Um, some kind of remain fixed in tissue, others wander through tissue, um, and they're uh, named differently depending on their function. So we're gonna walk our way through this process of emigration. The first step is positive chemotaxis. So let's break that word down. Chemo is chemical, taxis is movement, like getting in a taxi and going somewhere, um, or an Uber, I guess now is the more appropriate thing to do, but chemotaxis is movement towards a chemical or away from a chemical. Positive chemotaxis is going to the chemical, negative chemotaxis is moving away from the chemical signal. So these leukocytes perceive signals from wounds or from pathogens, and they move towards um, the site of those, uh, the, the stronger concentration of those substances. Um, and then endothelial cells, the cells lining the blood vessels, have these uh, proteins on them called selectins. And so they cut the um, white blood cells kind of slow as they bump into the selectins, and then they're going to make their way out of the blood vessels. So they start squeezing through those endothelial cells and kind of get tethered to them with more um, proteins called integrins. So they're kind of staying fixed at that site to make sure that they're able to make it to where there's that strong positive chemical gradient um, where the wound, the injury, or the infection is coming from. And then finally, they're able to differentiate. They function the way they're supposed to. They might phagocytose the um, bacteria, the pathogens, if there's invaders. Um, so they're able to kind of help in defense in that way. All right, so the last cell that we're going to talk about isn't actually a cell. It's a formed element, but it's not a cell. Uh, it's a thrombocyte, uh, which again is confusing because site tells you that it's a cell, but they're not. They're fragments of cells that come from these precursor cells called megakaryocytes. And as the megakaryocytes kind of bud and branch off, they form platelets, which are basically cytoplasm surrounded by cell membrane. So these are uh, produced and then stored um, in the spleen. So they are pr uh, coming from the kidneys and the liver, uh, or the signals are coming from the kidneys and the liver, um, and then the uh, platelets are produced and then the platelets are stored in the spleen. Um, so those are really important for uh, preventing hemorrhaging, preventing blood loss through clotting, which we'll talk about in just a moment. When you have too many thrombocytes, that's called thrombocytosis. When you don't have enough, that's called thrombocytopenia. So that idea is really important to keep in mind because there's a careful balance between enough clotting and too much clotting. So clotting can be very good. It can also be very dangerous if you think about blood clots, deep vein thrombosis, different ideas like that. Okay, so let's walk our way through hemostasis. Um, this is, again, a fancy word of saying clotting. Um, and so if you can't undergo hemostasis, you hemorrhage, you lose blood, and it's very dangerous. Um, so conditions like hemophilia, where you can't clot, you can die from very uh, some, from wounds that would you know, not seem to be too dangerous. Um, but if you can't clot, it's very serious. So please make sure you're familiar with this process and that you're able to kind of work through it for a written question.
So there's a lot of information on this slide. Um, you're welcome to read through that big diagram on your own time. There's kind of different pathways involved, um, but in general, you should know that an injury occurs. There's something called a vascular spasm. The platelet plug forms, and then you have coagulation. So we're gonna walk our way through vascular spasm, platelet plug formation, coagulation, and then briefly talk about the factors that mediate all of this. All right, so the first step of hemostasis is again that vascular spasm. So vascular should make you think about blood vessels. What's happening here is that endothelium, the cells lining your blood vessels, uh, release endothelins, these proteins, in response to an injury. And those are gonna cause the smooth muscle in your blood vessels to contract. Um, we talked a little bit about this when we were talking about blood vessel physiology a couple lectures ago. Happens, you have platelet plug formation. So as the platelets get to that spasm, they're going to clump together. Um, that's mediated in part by a protein called von Willebrand factor. Um, and then those platelets, as they clump together, release ADP, adenosine diphosphate, that's going to reinforce the platelet plug with more platelets. Um, they also release serotonin, which maintains that vasoconstriction, make sure that um, the uh, vascular spasm continues, um, and then they also release prostaglandins and phospholipids that are continued to maintain vasoconstriction and also activate more clotting chemicals. So then finally, you have um, what's called a coagulation cascade, where you have a series of different signals and effects that are happening. Um, and ultimately what's gonna happen is, remember we talked about that plasma protein, fibrinogen, um, that's going to be converted to fibrin, which is going to form this strong mesh that you can see in yellow, that's gonna trap platelets and blood cells to make a stronger clot. And that's mediated by different clotting factors. Um, the cascade that happens here is different depending on how the injury occurs. So if, it exter uh, if it's extrinsic, if it occurs due to trauma, then you go through one pathway. If there's internal vessel damage, that's intrinsic pathway. And then this last part um, where fibrin is produced is the same either way. It goes along the common pathway. And that detailed image that I um, had at the beginning of this hemostasis section has those different pathways and the different chemical cascades. You don't need to know them, but if you're curious, you can look at those. So when we're thinking about different clotting factors, those include fibrinogen, prothrombin, uh, calcium ions, and vitamin K. Um, there's about 12 total clotting factors that are especially important. Um, I'm not gonna test you on all of them, but you should know kind of what I've shown you here. Okay, so like I mentioned, there has to be an important balance when you're clotting um, because a blood clot can be very dangerous. Um, it can deprive your brain, different parts of your body from oxygen. Um, and so you have to have ways of kind of breaking down the clot over time to allow blood flow to resume after healing occurs. Um, and then also preventing unnecessary clots from happening in the first place. So fibrinolysis um, is this gradual breakdown of a clot in which you have vasodilation occurring. So remember, the clot started with vasoconstriction. Now you have vasodilation where you're allowing more blood flow to go through. Um, there is a precursor called plasminogen that's converted to plasmin. So plasminogen is inactive, plasmin is active, and then that's going to break down that fibrin that was produced from fibrinogen and was forming the bulk of the clot. So fibrinolysis is the lysis of a fibrin system. It's the breakdown of a clot after a clot has actually formed. Plasma anticoagulants are substances that float through the blood and prevent unnecessary clots. So plasma means they're in the blood. Anticoagulant means it's going to stop coagulation from occurring. These are things like antithrombin, heparin. Remember, we talked about that being secreted from basophils and other different circulating substances that again occur that clots are only uh, ensure that clots are only happening where you have an actual injury instead of other parts of your body. So this was uh, an overview of blood. I know it's kind of a shorter lecture, which thank God, um, but I will 
post the next lecture on Sunday about the immune system. As usual, please email me if you have any questions. Um, you will have a quiz on Monday through Wednesday. It will be available on Canvas about uh, the cardiovascular physiology, respiratory physiology, and blood physiology. Um, please make sure you look over the study guides that are posted over the lectures so that you have an idea of what you'll be tested on and email me if you have any questions.